thank you everybody for coming to the Curtis Jones Minimalism IEPPV Collaborative Talk. I don't want to call it a class or a workshop because we want to keep it casual and we just want to chat a little bit. Um, Curtis is somebody that I met through the TWIP community this week in photo. And sort of, I, I knew his fiance, Renee Robin first, and then Curtis through, through her. So that's been kind of fun. And, and we get to hang out weekly at our, our Friday member mixers and get to argue about all kinds of wonderful things, which is really, really fun. So um, as for those of you that don't know uh, who IEPPV is, we are a, an affiliate of PPA, the Professional Photographers of America. So if you, if you know who that is, then you'll kind of understand where we fall in that range. Um, this year, <clears throat> we're starting to transition back to some live events. So for those of you that are in our area that can participate, um, we're going to be, I think I'm looking at the calendar, probably April or May, we're going to start moving into some of our first in-person classes. So keep an eye on the IEPBB.com website, and we'll keep you guys informed of how all that's going. Um, I also want to thank the DVE store, the digital video um, electronic store for providing this Zoom account so that we can have it in HD. So you can see our guest Curtis's beautiful face in HD and when he shares his images and he streams like, so we'll, we'll be able to do that. All of this is being recorded by the way. So if there's any hitches in your ability to watch or view or you miss something that Curtis says and he didn't doesn't answer it in the questions, that stuff can all, um, be watched later. And plus, he's also part of the TWIP community. So if you guys are a part of that there, don't don't hesitate to reach out to him. He's, he's very gracious with his time and he likes to answer questions and um, he loves coffee. So you can always you can always find a way to tip him with with uh, with some coffee. So um, anyway, that's a, that's enough of me talking. Um, Curtis, I'm going to let you go ahead and introduce yourself really quick, and then you can you can run with it from there. Share your your screen and take it away. All right. Well, thanks thanks for having me and 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 the invitation, and uh, thanks for bearing with me this evening. Uh, I've had a couple little hiccups here in the house. We have a conflict of uh, online scheduling, and uh, there's a bit of a storm blowing up here, and I'm getting um reports from my power company that we may have a uh, rolling blackouts and stuff so uh we'll see we'll see how this all goes but i'm i'm happy to be here and i'm super excited to share some uh some of uh, my minimalist images um and like troy said i i want to answer whatever questions you guys have uh or comments uh so i'd like i'd like to keep it as casual and conversational as as possible uh to ask me or jump in on the chat or whatever at any point in time or if you want to keep if you're one of these you know people who'd rather save it to the end that's fine too but uh and again just to reiterate what troy said uh, reach out to me um on any one of my social media things or through the Twitter community or anything like that if there's something you'd like to dive into here because to be honest and you'll see as we get started here with the little talk uh minimalism for me it started as almost like um it's sort of accidentally I kind of like fell into it a little bit um but quickly and over the years I started to really di deep dive into it and to the point where it, it's it's quite a big big topic I mean for something that's supposed to be on the surface all about simplification the more you look into it the the deeper and bigger and sort of uh uh, more meaningful all this stuff gets so we're just going to sort of like brush over a lot today i've got maybe three key areas that i want to talk about so if there's anything you guys want to know above and beyond that uh, please do reach out um so i can go ahead and just start the slides i've got a little bit in there about myself at the beginning anyway so no need to double dip on that let's see and Troy, just go ahead and tell me if this doesn't share for you guys. Nope, looks great. All right. So the first thing you're going to notice is that uh, this isn't the same title as the title of this talk. But that's okay. We're going to roll with it. I, <laughs> I forgot to change it at the title slide. 
<laughs> that's right. You guys, you, you and I actually never talked about it. I just made that title up, which, yeah. which is fine, right? It's all about <laughs> yeah. minimalism. It's going to work. That's right. Yeah. You don't overcomplicate it with too much back and forth. Right. So here's me. Uh, this is these three photos uh, are kind of, uh, I feel like they capture a lot of what it is I do, either for fun, uh, for personal work, or uh, to be paid. I'm often outside. I, I get asked, like, what kind of photographer are you? I'll say outdoor photographer, mostly because 95% of what I shoot is outside. And I do portraits. I do commercial work. I do stock. I teach. Um, you know, I do my own personal work. I do adventure and travel. But, like, all of it is outside. So I just call myself an outdoor photographer. And quite often, this is the kind of stuff. These are the places and the situations I'll find myself in, you know, rock climbing, um, you know, mountainous lakes or tons of pack ice. I also do uh, commercial work and it's not something that I advertise that much or show a lot of on my website, but uh, in smaller sort of pockets of the world, I do have a few clients that I work with. A lot of it, again, is related to either adventure or, or sort of outdoor sport kind of stuff. Uh, adventure and travel. So whether I'm teaching, guiding, like doing workshops, uh, writing, and uh, creating just content for, for marketing and stuff like that, a lot of it is in the adventure and travel world. And so um, that fits in quite nicely with just like my personal lifestyle. I love to travel. I, I spend a lot of my time exploring and going to new places. And my start with photography actually was in the expedition adventure world. So before I was even considering this as a profession or getting paid for it, I was already doing travel and adventure photography. And then finally, um, I in the last five, six years, I've really sort of jumped on the teaching. I, I enjoy bringing people out. I enjoy teaching and talking and, and uh, discussing photography and, and just hanging out with people, mostly again in the outdoors, bringing people to places that I like and I wanna go myself and, and introducing it to them. So a lot of my time in the field is either spent teaching photography or just guiding in general. I guide uh, in the Northern Canada um, with or without the camera. And uh, a lot of the guiding I do in Antarctica, for example, will have nothing to do with photography either sometimes. Uh, so um, that's, that's, those are sort of the areas that I'm, I'll play in. Now, we talked about the slideshow. I'll, maybe I'll wait and just see how it goes and see how we're doing for time. And I can show you guys a little slideshow of the kind of work that I do. Um, just for the sake of <laughs> beating the power outage, maybe. Um, <laughs> but otherwise, uh, or I can put the, the link up um, and you guys can go ahead and, and watch that at any time you want. But yeah, Troy, if there's a good time to jump a slideshow in there at some point or toward the end, just let me know. Yeah, we'll do it right at the very end, like kind of wrap it up. Okay. Yeah, that'd be great. So the reason why I include this these next three slides, whenever I talk about minimalism is because this is really like I was saying at the beginning, I kind of fell into minimalism. It wasn't something I was seeking out. To be honest, when I first started photography and uh, taking it more seriously and considering it uh, as a serious amateur, I guess, not a professional, but you know, that point where you get where you, you're intentional about your work, I still wasn't really... <clears throat> looking for other people to inspire me. I was still very much trying to figure out what it is I wanted to shoot on my own. Um, and that's not necessarily say that that was the right thing. I think I was just ignorant to the fact that there was a bigger world of photographer out there, photographers and photography out there. So I just wasn't aware of it to look for it. So what was shaping my vision was where I was. So instead of uh, books and, and articles and other people's work and stuff, I was very much being shaped by the location I was in. And the location itself was Nunavut, in Arctic Canada. Uh, I moved up there as a pharmacist. And that's what I went to school for. I graduated. I worked for 11, almost 12 years as a pharmacist in the territory of Nunavut. And in that time, I transitioned from pharmacy to full-time photography. And I haven't I haven't looked back. I have, I let my license lapse. I've never pushed a pill uh, since then. Um, <laughs> other than to like family members who, for whatever reason, just don't believe that I'm not a pharmacist anymore and will come to me for advice. 
Um, so Nunavut very much shaped my vision and that vision very much became minimalist and simplified based on the fact that it's a place of stark contrast and uh, you know open space and beautiful light and just like stoic people, um, wonderful, warm, generous people, but quiet and uh, very funny. Um, but a place of, of just epic light and just it's unobstructed, right? There's big, big skies and infinite horizons and everything most of the year is white and, and covered in a blanket of beautiful snow. And so a lot of the images I was taking without even knowing it were just simple by default. And I realized that uh, whenever I sort of mentor or teach people about minimalism, that's one of the hardest things for them to overcome if they live in an urban environment or a place that's more cluttered or it's, you know, it's not <laughs> covered in snow for 11 months of the year. But it's, it's these, these ideas are still applicable to those situ situations. I, I'll go on record saying, though, it is easier to shoot minimalist photography with snow. <laughs> so, Curtis. Um, yeah. So how, you know, in your vision of, of minimalism and, and having gone, you know, from a place where it's, it's easy to see things like it's stark, right? How does somebody <clears throat> learn or adopt minimalism as a style, maybe not a hundred percent like what you're doing, but to, to, to be able to go out into an environment, let's say they live in the city. How do they, how do they look for it? How do they start to adopt that? Yeah, the, the easiest way, and we'll go through a few examples. Um, but the, I think that the easiest way to start is just by noticing space. And that might sound weird. And I know it sounds, it sounded strange to me because it, it's an exact line that my art teacher gave me in high school. And I, I don't know how many of you people, if you've had this experience, but in high school art class, I was drawing a plant and the teacher would come over and say, don't draw the plant, draw the space between the leaves. And I was like, that's crazy. You're high. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? I'm going to draw the leaf. And then if I drew a chair, it was like, don't draw the chair, draw the space between the legs of the chair. I was just like, what is going on? But, but now I get it. And it's the same for like minimalist photography. If you go out and you start looking at these scenes that you've walked by a hundred times before, and instead of looking at the subjects, so if it's graffiti on a wall or, um, you know, uh, people walking on the street or whatever, look for the spaces between the people and look for those, those clean gaps and things like that. And when you start seeing that kind of stuff, then you're going to start naturally composing uh, intentionally for that space. So where you want people to be placed based on the spaces between people and subject and background and things like that. And then the next thing I would say to really focus on is spending time with a subject. So if you're walking the streets and uh, there's a, you know, maybe it's your morning routine to work or to your local coffee shop, and there's like a particular play of light that you notice all the time, and you think it's pretty, oh, that might be a nice photograph. I don't really understand why. Um, someday when you don't have to get to where you're going, like just take the camera and spend an hour exploring that, that play of light or whatever it is right that that try different lenses different perspective different angles and start simplifying and decluttering the scene until all you're really shooting at that point is whatever it was that drew you in at the first place right the, that that color or that shaft of light or whatever um so i mean there are there are more practical and i'll talk about the examples in a second like the exercises i guess that you can actually go out and to train yourself to start seeing these but more abstractly, I would say, start trying to look for space, you know, harness that Jedi force a little bit and then uh, notice things that kind of hit you and spend some more time with them. Yeah, good advice. Yeah, it definitely, definitely takes time. So here's a few more shots of Nunavut. And this is the kind of stuff that I was shooting before I ever considered myself someone who shot minimalism or, or, I mean, again, I didn't even really understand what that was. It wasn't until I gave a talk years ago for a conference here in Canada um, and they wanted me to present on the North and I put together a slideshow, maybe you know, four minutes long or whatever. 
before I showed it to anybody, I showed it to some family and friends. And I just asked them like, what's one word that you would associate with this slideshow? And everybody came back as like stark or peaceful, they're calm, uh, empty, but minimal kept coming up, right? Simple kept coming up. And so then I started seeing, you know, maybe, maybe there's something to this. Maybe this is like a vision or a style that I have. Um, and that's when I started like going down the rabbit hole a little more and researching and finding articles and seeking out other examples of photographers who do minimalist work. And, you know, there was this amazing universe just waiting there of masters of photography I've been doing this obviously for, you know, a century. Um, so that's, then I, then I saw like the academic side of it a little bit more and started uh, deep diving, but up until that point, it was all just sort of stumbling along, um, it, because I was shooting what I saw, I was shooting where I was, I was shooting who I was with and the environment, and it just came out more simplified and decluttered, I guess, portraits. Which is great, um, um, because it really speaks to the idea that you don't just fall into a style, like sometimes it takes work. You know, yeah. you have to put effort into it and you have to challenge it. And, and so would you say that, that you are where you want to be or are you still chasing the perfect minimalistic, you know, Curtis Jones? Like, I, like, are you still chasing that? I still definitely chasing it because, um, because I still very much love shooting that way. So I'm not bored in any way with it. And I, I don't feel like I'm done with it at all. And also um one of the reasons was well, the reason I, I left the arctic but one of the reasons uh for leaving when i did was because i felt like i had reached a certain point with my photography and i wanted to see what else was out there in the world i wanted to seek out a larger peer group um for as beautiful and and amazing as it is and i go back there still every year to to work and to play uh, i understood there was a larger world of stuff out there that i needed to sort of like experience and test myself against and shooting this style or my vision was one of the things I needed to 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 do like for myself to grow as a as a photographer and as a creative and I realized really quickly it was like one of the worst years professionally and creatively of my life when I left the Arctic and moved back to southern Canada and realized that the style that I had made a name for myself with and I was getting paid to shoot and people you know, recognize me for, I couldn't do. Like, I absolutely struggled with, you know, like we just talked about urban landscapes and cluttered sort of seascapes and forests and, you know, all this other stuff. Um, so I really had to, like you just said, I had to buckle down and work that much harder to figure out how do I apply this style that I have, the way I see the world when the world doesn't look like it you know, as easily as it did in the North <laughs> with all the, the freebies, you know? Uh, Cause I still very much saw that stuff. Like I just said, that shaft of light or whatever was still catching my eye, but it wasn't as simple as just pointing the camera and letting, you know, snow and whatever, take care of the rest. So um, we can talk a little bit about why minimalism. We've covered a little bit of it already, but uh, from a practical perspective, minimalism simplifies compositions. It can enhance your subject. Uh, one of the most powerful and, and easiest concepts with minimalism, minimalism is uh, that if you do it correctly, there's just no denying what your viewer is supposed to look at. Like what you want them to pay attention to is there. There's no question about it. And that's not to say that every image is supposed to be that way, but this is one way to go about doing it for sure. Sometimes you want the person, you know, your viewer to kind of be taken on a journey through the entire frame and you cover every inch. Uh, other times you want to remove everything so that when they look at it, they see it. And uh, they, you know, they, they can sit with that subject and think about it. And one of the things I really enjoy as far as feedback goes is when I have one of these images on a wall somewhere and somebody uh, mentions that, the longer they sit with it, the more questions they have, right? Instead of just like looking at this epic, beautiful landscape that has the perfect uh, blend of uh, foreground and midground and background and it's focus stacked and 
it's blended, you know, every exposure makes sense. And there's a lot going on in it. Um, they're left with just like a single subject and a stark scene uh, to wonder like, well, where is everything else? Why did they not include anything else? Like what is so important? And I, I, I like that. Uh, you can create balance and evoke strong emotion. So it's, it's, it's a very powerful tool when used correctly to uh, convey story and emotion, but also balance. Uh, I found that when I was learning how to compose um, shooting simplified images or shooting with a minimalist mindset, it really helps you build that skill of balancing your your compositions, like where you're placing the different subjects for weight and effect. If you take a bunch of stuff out of the equation and you're only left with what you want people to see and concentrate on, it becomes all that more important where you place those things in relation to each other. And then you can easily see that if you have it, two things right here in the middle, it's very heavy center focus or center balance. You have one thing up here and one thing way down here in the corner, you know, the eye is kind of darting back and forth. If you push everything over to the left, the balance and the weight is over there. And sometimes you can get away with it, right? So for example, uh, like using a human element or a small sailboat on a big ocean, for example, um, you can put a tiny sailboat in a very big scene and still that sailboat is gonna take most of the weight. It's gonna have most of the balance and the power because it's something that we just attach naturally so much um, importance to. The same thing with humans. Every time you put a tiny little person under a massive astroscape, uh, that person can be very small in comparison to the to the sky above it because we're conditioned to see humans as important. So that balance and that weight uh, is is fun to play with. It's easier to see shape and form, uh, just like with black and white. Uh, if you take away color and you take away clutter, you can take away all the noise. Uh, and any kind of distractions, you can really see your subject for its shape and its form. It gives your subject context and scale. It's a little bit what I just talked about. And it gives the viewer's eye a place to rest. So it's personally, this is just a personal preference, but I like simplified, not, it doesn't have to be completely minimal, but simplified prints on my wall in my home for the most part, uh, because they're easy to sit with and they can hang for years and they're not screaming for my attention. And if I want to like take a moment and hang out with it with a cup of coffee or a glass of wine or whatever, it's, it's just nice. The question of what an image is about becomes a lot easier to answer when you start simplifying your compositions. I've taken thousands and thousands of pictures of ice, but if I want somebody to just see a very particular piece of ice, I'm going to try to declutter the scene and only have that one piece of ice in there. And this image here, for example, was not just about getting all the other ice out of my frame and positioning myself so I could do that, but it was also about using a long exposure. So it takes texture out of the water, it takes texture out of the sky. And it's, this image is just about color and ice. So here's a few That's tips. Wonderful. I have, a, I have a question for you. So yeah. on, on images like that, how much Photoshop do you do to de-minimalize the frame? Is it, I mean- This you, one here? You find your, well, I mean, just any image in general, okay. right? I mean, there's, there's times when we need Photoshop to do that. And then there's times when we put the technique into the camera. I'm just kind of wondering where you land in yeah. there. I, I will try to do as much as I can in camera. Uh, and not because I'm a purist or for ethical reasons or anything like that necessarily, but I just, I'm not, I'm not a big Photoshop user. I'm, I'm not averse to it, but I just prefer to be outside <laughs> and shooting. And the more I can take care of in camera, the, the, the more I enjoy that. But almost every image at some point, unless you get really lucky, there's going to be something, right? So whether it's, for example, um, well, this isn't a good example because this was a really clean image. There was just a single piece of ice and it was that time of day where you just had like a nice sky. So this was as simple as like putting the ND filter on and, you know, doing a, a longer exposure to really flatten out the, the water there. But there, there probably, let's say there was a few little like icy chunks between me and that berg uh, in the mid ground and foreground. And yeah, in Photoshop, I would go in there and just like, get rid of them. 
so, you know, if there was like one or two little blurry chunks in there. So that big berg is grounded. So over the course of 30, 40, 60 seconds, whatever this exposure was, there's not much camera, like there's no blur in the berg moving in the water because it's grounded. But any free float in the berg-y bits, those guys are going to be like, you know, ghosting all over the front of the frame. So in that situation, if those bits were there and that's what was happening, I would Photoshop them out if they didn't really add anything to the scene, if they were distractions. Um, but I don't, so little things like that, crops, uh, black and white conversions, more and more I'm, I'm shooting in black and white in camera, uh, like at least in black and white mode so that I can just commit to that a little bit if I decide to go out and shoot that way. Uh, but I don't regularly or very often, I won't basically Photoshop in a blizzard, you know what I mean? Or Photoshop uh, in a, uh, a new plank, less distracting sky or anything like that. Uh, I've done it. Um, and with mixed results, I think mostly I'm just not good enough at Photoshop for the images to look any good. So that's that's a, a reason why I, I don't do it that often. The images just come out kind of shitty. And so I go, you know what? I could probably just like well, it, I mean, <laughs> try to do a better enough. job of getting it right in camera. And in camera is always better, right? The, mm. the, the better and the more we get them on the pixels, the, the better. But it also shows intention in an image, which I think is something that, um, you know, I've been shooting for 30 years. I still make a great effort to be like, okay, how do I do this in camera as opposed to, yeah, you know, hack it out in Photoshop later? But yeah, and and a lot of times what I run into is like on the prairies or something like that is uh, an an errant uh, fence post or something like that, you know. And so I yeah, I'll probably chop that out in Photoshop if I can't get an angle or a perspective. But a lot of times too, it's that intention you were just talking about is the difference between leaving your 24 to 70 on and putting on 70 to 200 and just zooming past that fence post right you get a very similar shot and the fence post is gone so there's a lot of that going on perfect it's and in my mind there's not a huge difference between other than like how you choose to shoot for whatever whatever suits you best and how you enjoy like between chopping it out in photoshop or putting on a different lens and chopping it out it's the same effect you're still changing the scene from what it is naturally right yep yeah very good good lesson yeah. so here's a couple few little tips uh we talked about this a little bit about you know shooting in your own backyard or on your street or whatever like letting places settle i was a big uh sort of like worry ward. I was very anxious when I first started shooting. I'd, I'd show up to new places and just go crazy. I'd have like three cameras all running and just running around and not really getting anything uh, other than like <laughs> more and more anxious, I guess. Uh, afraid I would miss every, you know everything so I get nothing kind of scenario. Um, so by concentrating and focusing on this vision, this sort of simplified minimalism approach, here, here's like one of the really like happy side effects is that it, it helped me just calm down in general. You know, my, my approach to photography and to just being outside became less Red Bull and a little more National Geographic, you know, like I was just like a little more chill. I was a little more calm. I let a place settle. I wouldn't take camera to the bag for the first 20, 30 minutes. If I had the time, I would walk around, just hang out see what was happening all that gets blown out of the water as soon as like the perfect sunset starts kicking off then yeah i'm back into like crazy squirrel brain again um but for the most part if i could control it um there's also a good reason to go out and shoot on foggy days and snowstorms because you just have no pressure i love absolutely love shooting the moment the sun has gone down past the horizon i hate i absolutely hate shooting the the seven minutes of sunset it's the worst for me because my anxiety is through the roof thinking about like every shot i'm missing and like the commitment to one frame and when that pressure is gone and the light doesn't matter like 
That's why I love overcast days, snowy days, foggy days, because uh, I can just chill out. Um, depth of field is another big one. Uh, so if you can shoot with a with a faster lens and uh, your camera wide open, that's a great way to minimize distractions in a cluttered environment. So going back to like street photography and urban centers and stuff like that, shoot at like 2.8 or below. And uh, it doesn't matter how crazy your scene is. If you find the right subject and you can focus on it, then what you're going to be able to do is start using the third shape that we've been talking about in the background to just sort of enhance your composition. Um, but also on top of that, I do a lot of in the field manipulation. So I'll get behind, if I'm shooting, um, if I'm shooting sort of a, a crashing wave or something like that, and there's just like empty space in front of me, here's the thing about, uh, I'm jumping over around a little bit, but here's the thing about minimalism after I shot it for several years, I realized that my portfolio was really boring. I had like a lot of powerful images, um, but after a while, if you stack them all together, it just looked sort of oversimplified or flat. And so I needed to, once I sort of grasped minimalism, the, the next thing I had to do was figure out how to build depth back into my photos. And that's one of the things that I really worked on when I left the North was how do I take these crazy chaotic scene of like fishing stages and 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 small outport Newfound rural Newfoundland and stuff like that and, and make them simple and and minimal but but in a way that I still include a lot of this stuff that makes them unique right and that was about building depth so one of the ways that I build depth back into what could be a boring flat image uh, is by using the environment so I'll intentionally put on a 200 millimeter lens I'll stick it right up next to the edge of a shed so that it obstructs or blurs part of my frame. And then I'll shoot past that and just focus on that one boat, you know, that's out there in the distance. And so part of my frame is sort of like this out of focus shape or color that's sort of drawing the eye in and you go past that and you're building that foreground, mid ground background in the, in the field. I do a lot of that with trees and grass and whatnot. Telephoto we talked about, longer exposures help even out textures in the sky and in water and uh, changing your perspective to frame out clutter, just like with the fence post. Okay, so here's a couple of examples. These are puffins, North Atlantic puffins. And so I'm gonna go through these slides and just uh, talk about how I would sort of simplify or declutter or change my perspective to try to simplify an image down to something. And these are all like all over the coast of Newfoundland. Uh, in the summertime, you can go and hang out with these guys and they are about the size as a, of a can of Coke and they're terrible little flyers, but amazing swimmers. Um, they, they call them the clowns of the sea and that's kind of, I mean, they're, they're wonderful to watch. It's my favorite, they're my favorite bird for sure. Puffins and ravens. But uh, when you go and photograph these guys, this is often what it looks like. It's very cluttered. It's very messy. They're everywhere. The, their lifestyle is everywhere. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to isolate one or two of them against a clean background. So that's the first step. So instead of just shooting them, like I said, being anxious and running around and just shooting whatever you see, uh, a lot of it is about patience and waiting for them to come over from their little island to hang out with you, you know, getting low to the ground so that I didn't have that. So if I was standing up, this puffin, this bird would be against that rocky backdrop and all the other puffins still. So by getting low, I'm putting him against the sky and I'm using some of that foreground I was just talking about so that it kind of blurs softly and leads the eye in and gets rid of a lot of the texture and the grass. But there's still like some distractions with that those taller pieces of grass close to the puffin. So I knew it could be a cleaner shot. So what I ended up doing, and this is over the course of like several hours hanging out with these birds, is just waiting and following and watching where the birds were going and noticing that like there was a couple of them that were coming over and just perching and hanging out in this one little space of rock. And that gave me like a perfect clean background. And I just kind of like, well, Renee has behind the scenes footage of it. I, I 
I hung out over this like 500 foot sea cliff basically and and took this shot uh against this clean background and um that i mean that's an extreme example of changing your perspective to get a clean background but it's the the lessons the same um if you can do it safely i love it i mean this looks like something that you would have shot in a studio yeah which are, and i think really speaks to the idea that you know your your work is very intentional so mm -hmm. yeah and it like i said it takes it takes a lot of time because this is this is what most people shoot if they come as tourists and like they get off, you know, the bus and they go out and they shoot and they spend three hours out there and they go away with this, you know, and maybe some people are getting this when they come over, but it's about, well, it can become this though, right? Mm -hmm. If you start noticing that uh, there are clean spaces, it's again about that space. Here's another example of fur seals in Antarctica. So the first time I went to Antarctica, I was just like, forget my ethics and my morality about like taking my time and being intentional. Like everything is amazing. I don't know if I'm ever coming back to Antarctica again. So here we go. Just like bang, 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 bang. So for the first, my first trip to Antarctica was six sailings. So the first two sailings were that just like brrrap, everything. And my work showed it like, it looked like this, you know? So if I was to, to take a critical eye at this, uh, this is the kind of stuff that I notice. This is just also something I do. I'm, I'm paying attention in the field, but when I get back and I look at my images, I'm, I'm looking at my images on my screen in Lightroom or whatever, uh, and noticing what's distracting. How can I fix this? And if it's something I can fix in the field by going out and shooting it again, like, uh, like a fence tree, I'll go out and shoot it again. If it's something I took in Antarctica and I'm never going back again, yeah. Photoshop the heck out of that because why not? But in this case, I was going back to this place like five more times. So, um, you know, so that that ice in the background is distracting, the penguins distracting. Although, do I want the penguin as part of the story? I don't really know at this point. The rocks are distracting. Um, the fur seal itself, that's not a great shape. Uh, if you're looking for, again, that space, you know, if you want to see the space between the legs of the chair, it's not there. This is what I'm talking about, right? Don't shoot the fur seal, shoot the space. Um, so you want to create form uh, like this. This is a nice space, but it would be nicer if I had a, an angle where it was against that clean uh, ocean background, not the rocky background, not the pebbles, right? And the penguin. So waiting for the seal to stand up a little bit. I have a better shape. Uh, I've sort of got rid of a lot of the annoying stuff in the background. Now I have more penguins because believe it or not, I have no control over those guys. They do whatever they want. Um, but the first seal has better shape, better form. And again, getting back to that original point, what is my image about? It's easier now than this image. Okay. What is my image about? What is my image about? Okay. A little bit more strong, a little more clear that it's about the first seal, but these guys, again, are a distraction. The rocks are still bothering me, but I like this space. Then there's this final image where, again, just like the puffin, I waited until I found a perspective and an angle where I had them against that perfect, uh, clean sort of um, backdrop. And I can't remember if, I'm pretty sure that was ice at this point. The penguins were at a frame. I put on a longer lens. I waited for him to get in a position, like a more pleasing shape. And I got really low, like I was lying down in a lot of penguin shit at this point <laughs> to get that low perspective and that that sort of that blur out again that foreground that's something i do a ton of just to kind of lead the eye past if i didn't do that if that foreground wasn't there like that and it was just the the fur seal and then background it, you see how that picture wouldn't have as much depth as much dimension it's still a very simple minimal image but uh but probably possibly less interesting without the foreground. Um, it doesn't have context the same way I find. So now we have all this beautiful negative space. Here is another simple example. It's a lighthouse here in Newfoundland, just like 10 minutes from our house here in St. John's. And uh, I just hiked over and shot. I've shot this lighthouse dozens, hundreds of times. Um, and I wanted a slightly different perspective, something with a little more uh, scale and, and uh, to show off like just how big the ocean and the sky is out there. But again, this scene is 
super distracting in the sense that, I mean, there's not very much going on, but there's a lot of texture in the sky. There's a lot of texture in the water. So to me, it can be simpler. And this is in a situation where I will put on uh, neutral density filters and turn it into something like this. Uh, also converting to black and white because color doesn't really add. There's nothing here. There's no reason. It's not a great, you know, color image. The sky isn't doing amazing things. Um, the water isn't really showing off beautiful greens or anything like that. So simplify the image, put on a longer exposure, turn it to black and white. And then it's just about, you know, smooth gradients and shape. Um, and yeah, again, just simplicity. Um, that brings us to the next thing I'd like to talk about, which is negative space space and oftentimes and again for me in the beginning i often got confused not that it matters i guess between like what minimalism was and what negative space was because they a lot go hand in hand i guess uh but negative space is becoming more and more important in my work even the stuff that's not it has nothing to do with minimalism or simplified compositions um seeing being able to see that space and why you use it. For example, negative space, uh, the last couple of years with COVID and all that kind of stuff and not traveling as much and 90% of my work not being available because my 90% of my work is traveling, adventure photography and guiding. Um, I was doing a lot more stock work uh, and uh, marketing images and going through my back catalog and stuff like that. And so realizing the importance of negative space just for graphics, for copy, for art um, in, in marketing and sales is super important. But negative space is the space that surrounds the main element of interest. And then by default, positive space is that actual subject, the main element of interest. And here's a really quick example of that. Here's a shot of pack ice in Antarctica. And this is an example of what I would consider 100% positive space. There's nothing in there that looks more important than anything else. And you're all probably looking at a different piece of ice. And so if I asked you to pick out uh, three pieces of ice out of all of this, you're all gonna probably give me three different pieces. Versus the next slide, if I said, pick out three pieces of ice, I'm guessing that most of you just jumped immediately to the right top corner. And that's the that's what negative space can do for your compositions. Just very quickly, very powerfully simplify what you want your subject to be and where you want your viewers to see that subject. Where's Waldo is another great example. That's exactly what it is. 100% positive space. It makes it super hard to find Waldo. But if you take away all of Waldo's friends and just put him in a sea of negative space, he's not that hard to find at all. Yeah, I had it. I had it described to me that the the negative space is you can consider that to be part of your subject, mm -hmm. right? Because you, it's it's they it's supporting your subject. So to to ignore negative space is sort of a mistake for all of us. Whether whether you're shooting something like the pack ice or I'm shooting a bride on a mountaintop, like that that space matters. That's that's mm -hmm. part of my subject matter. Yeah, a hundred percent. And like a couple slides down from here, I talk about just that idea of how the subject can actually just be the that visual mass of emptiness like that could be your subject maybe um the person or the bride is secondary right like maybe the story you're trying to tell is about the location and then secondary to that is the experience of being in the location right so in that situation the negative space is more important than the bride um, but with positive space, nothing's more important than anything else. Your eye gets no direction. And so you don't know what you should be paying attention to. I, also with um, negative space, you can play a lot with that balance I was talking about. And in this situation, we're balancing positive and negative. And just because it's easy to think about positive space as being white space and negative space as being black space, it doesn't, that doesn't necessarily mean, it's just easiest when you're starting to probably shoot in black and white and think about it that way, but that's not the case. Like Troy just mentioned, you know, he could do a, a bridal shoot and still use the balance between positive and negative space to tell very different stories 
within, you know, 20 minutes of shooting. So here are a few examples of that. This is going to be uh, three shots, all with a similar subject. Um, the first one is mostly positive space with a little bit of minimal or negative space. And here's the subject with about a 50-50 split, positive and negative. And here's the subject that's got very little positive space and mostly negative space. So these are, I mean, granted, there are different shots of different penguins, but I feel like they all tell different stories of the same subject, right? This guy, you have a tiny penguin in a very big Antarctic space. So it's not just about the penguin. It's about the penguin in that place. And if anything, like we were just saying with the bride, this shot is more about Antarctica and the space than it is about the penguin. This one is kind of like that sweet middle ground, you know, an animal in its habitat. And this is very much a portrait. Like it's not really about Antarctica at all. This could be in a zoo. This is a portrait of a penguin. So uh, I mentioned I had a couple little exercises. This is the first one. If you're interested in trying this stuff and you want to, to go out in your backyard or even around the house, uh, find a subject and then just work through those three scenarios. Try that equal positive and negative space, try that mostly negative space, and then try the mostly positive space. And it doesn't have to be complicated. Take a cup of coffee tomorrow morning, shoot it so it's mostly positive space, shoot it so that it's 50%, 50%, and shoot it so that it's mostly negative space. And look at those three images and see, see how those three images tell three different stories. And then you can apply that to every kind of photography you do. Here's a really simple example with a tree, just to give you that visual sort of anchor of what I'm talking about. Simple things you guys can do in a park. You can do it on your back deck, but it's a good way it's to start. Missing, it's just missing a bride right there to the right of the tree. That's what it's missing. <laughs> yeah. So which, which, which shot would you put the bride in? Which one do you, which one calls to you? The middle one. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> but the bride would be closer to me, you know, so the tree's further away, but yeah. I, have... I love Yeah. That. Yeah. There you go. Don't feel like you have to cram something interesting to every square inch of the frame. And that's something I struggled with in the beginning. Uh, again, back to those days of like anxious Curtis running around. I really did feel like I had to create those images, those wide angle, you know, 12, 14, 16 millimeter landscapes that just front to back and all the way through had everything so that I could sort of somehow translate that to my viewer, you know, uh, so they could experience that. And I still like taking those images and I, I do take those images and I love other photographers who take those images and do it well. And I'm actually a bit envious because I just, because I, I can't seem to nail it the same way. But a lot of that has to do with the fact that I, I don't think I'm wired that way. I think I'm wired to see space and simple, right? Like, so as much as I want to take those images, because I think they look amazing when other people have show them, when I go to do it, there's something that kind of like nags at me to say like, no, that cactus has to go, or yeah, no, that, you know, that cloud shouldn't be there, or ch -ch 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 -ch, until I'm left with, you know, just myself standing in the desert, you know, <laughs> <laughs> topless looking at the sky. <laughs> so, which, you know, can make money, I guess, in some spaces of the internet. Sometimes the more space you give a subject, the more powerful it becomes. Uh, and that's, this is something I like to play with a ton. It's the idea of taking uh, very powerful subjects and making them look tiny or less powerful at first. So here's, a, here's an iceberg. And this is like the same iceberg I showed you guys at the beginning of that duotone sort of yellow and blue long exposure we had, uh, except I went back out on a foggy day, shot the same bird because like I said, it was grounded. So it wasn't going anywhere for about a week. And uh, I just shot it so that there was nothing but empty space above it. There was this perfect cloud bank that obscured it, uh, just poked out a little bit. And to me, 
uh, when I printed this and like blew it up big or whatever, I just loved looking at it because the longer I looked at it, it was, it was what first looked like I had taken the power away from that iceberg, that iceberg just became more and more powerful. Like it drew me in more and more and more. And it's kind of like, I like describing it as like, um, like the big pen in your pocket, you get a little ink stain and the more you notice it or more that people notice that ink stain, the, the more powerful that ink stain becomes, you know, versus like, if you just had a tie dyed shirt on, you walk in through the door and everyone's going to say, Whoa, that shirt is crazy. But five minutes later, nobody, nobody's going to notice it. Like it's all, it's done. It, it sort of like it, you know what I mean? It had its moment. It got the attention, but you walk around all day with an ink stain on your shirt in one spot. Like it's forever going to have attention. Does that make sense? <laughs> makes a lot of sense. Oh no, it makes perfect sense. It's it's uh, it's minimalism at its at its most powerful, right? Yeah. And um, I think it's how our brains work. Our brains like that. Yeah. Yeah. So we lean into it. Shape and form. Icebergs in Antarctica. We take people out in these little zodiacs and we cruise around in the icebergs. And this little location is called the Iceberg Graveyard. Um, there's just hundreds of these amazing gnarly shapes uh, and you can see here in the bottom um this little zodiac with about 12 people on it bottom left uh just for scale <laughs> but uh the the important thing what i like about this image is that it's not a super simple image but the negative space that i've used is different on the right and the left so I've used the space to create that, get to get the shape in the arch. And then I've used negative space of a white color to be able to see the Zodiac and the people, right? So if that Zodiac wasn't against the white wall, you probably wouldn't see them. They would just sort of blend into the, to the ocean or the background. And just like if there was another larger piece of ice blocking that arch behind this uh, main iceberg in the front, you wouldn't see the shape of the arch. So talking about minimalism it doesn't always have to be this image the concepts can apply to images that you you know don't necessarily think of as minimalist another example uh waiting for the negative in this case i consider the the bird to be the negative space so this is an example of a lot of positive space and a little bit of negative space, but again, playing with that balance and shape so that that little bit of negative space actually gets a lot of weight in the, in the image. So I have a question on, on the image before this with the, with the, with the boat, it was this the frantic Curtis uh, seeing that boat coming and pre-visualizing that shot or were you there and you were just very calmly shooting and the boat entered your scene and you went, oh, wow, that's really great. Uh, this was likely Curtis cruising by this iceberg, noticing how crazy the shape was and really just trying, because the, the thing is um, a lot of times I go out on these boats and I'm there to teach photography. I'm there to guide people how to take photos of the icebergs and stuff like that. So I don't always get a chance to shoot myself. I shoot, I don't shoot as much as I'd like to in Antarctica, but that's the job or places like that. So this was very much probably more frantic. This was me noticing that iceberg. I was probably taking my fourth group out. So I knew it was there. So at least I knew if I could get an angle and I'm not driving the boat at this point, right? That's the other thing. But I have a little more sway over where I want the group to go. So I know I can line it up this way. And then uh, in this case, 100% uh, honesty, what we did was we radioed one of the other boats to do a couple <laughs> runs back and forth. <laughs> so the, the answer is yes, it was anxious Curtis brain. And yes, there was some intention involved. <laughs> But I think but, that's I, I and I ask that because I think it's really wonderful that you know we can all learn that you know once we learn how to see a, a particular style right like minimalism, some of it we just have to see it happen, 
and yeah. oh, there's there's seagulls flying around. God, wouldn't it be great if a seagull flew into this frame? And then you're then you're patient and you wait. And then others are, God, if I had just had something against, oh, there's a boat. I got a radio. I make it happen. It, it's yeah. still the same thing, right? You're still using all those superpowers you've trained yourself to do. Um, and I, I just I just love that. That's just fantastic. That's great. Yeah. No, it's true. It's the pre-visualization skill that uh, that usually serves you best. Um, because yeah, in a, in a situation like this, it's really hard to control all those factors and create intentional photographs because you're there's so many moving parts and people counting on you for other reasons. As much as someone's going to love the photo, they, they don't care that it's going to take you four hours to get it. You've got a different job to do down there, you know? Uh, right, right. But if they're on their way, you know, back to the boat, and you know, they're going to go in that direction. It's, it's nice. I've got a couple images. I don't think in this presentation of just that though, like all the different shots that look epic. And then I tell the story about how like they're contrived um, or like, or we like, you know, plan them out to be that way kind of thing, which I think is yeah. fine. I mean, yeah, this is great. You, you remind me, you remind me of the reincarnation of Galen Rowell. If anybody <laughs> knows who, who Galen Rowell is, uh, do you know who he is? I know who he is. Yeah. I've got a ton yeah. of these books. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he, he is amazing. I mean, and, and his, when you were telling me about that story, it, it reminded me of his, and I had to look it up. It's the rainbow over Portala, Port, Portola, Portola Palace, the rainbow. Yep. Just look up Galen Rowell rainbow. Yeah. He, he was on yeah. a workshop. And he saw the rainbow and he knew, and he told his class, Hey, let's go do it. And the rest of the class is like, nah, it's wet and rainy. Yeah. And he created that. And it's, it's, that is, that is pure minimalism right there in that shot. Even so. Yeah. Yeah. No, I know that shot. I, and that's, I love that story. Uh, again, um, this is a house close to where those puffins were a little town called Elliston in Newfoundland. And we take workshops out there all the time. Uh, and I've shot this house a dozen times, but I never quite got it to, to be what I wanted it to be. Cause I always sort of shot it in color and I shot it on overcast days and things like that. And this is an example of shooting on a, not an overcast day, a very high contrast, bright blue day, but converting the black and white, leaning into those blacks in the sky and just making it all about the house, the shape of the house popping, um, so it, this is line and shape and form, and it could be cleaner. Um, you know, I'd love it if that island wasn't off to the right, but this is another example of an image where potentially if I really loved this, I could just Photoshop it the way I wanted it to be, or more likely in my case, because I love the area and I go back there several times a year and we teach there quite often. I'm just gonna wait for my opportunity to shoot it. Again, like I know now, more about how I want it to be. So I'll take the opportunity and it might take me a couple more summers or whatever, but I'll get it. I mean, it's probably best in the winter, to be honest. It's probably a winter shot. Snow fixes everything. And shoot. <laughs> yeah. Exercise two then uh, is the shoot uh, shape and form. So find a high contrast silhouette against a blank backdrop or a big sky and reveal the form of your subject. And this is really, really easy to do. Uh, for minimalist shooters, especially people who live in cities, if you can't find a big blank sky, uh, let's say you can't get to a rooftop and just shoot against the sky. Oftentimes you can find a blank wall, right? And so that's the easiest way to shoot uh, for form and shape. And what I like about this exercise is not that it helps you create cleaner images and see more minimal images, uh, and see space and form, but it also shows you the power of posing without uh, identity, if that makes sense. Like a silhouette, a pose silhouette has a lot of emotion. It has a lot of power and it could tell a lot of story, right? So this exercise is sort of twofold. It does help you uh, shoot cleaner, stronger shapes, but it can also, if you're working with people, for example, uh, can really up your game with like sort of that silhouette pose. Uh, this is getting to what we were talking about with the bride on the mountaintop, visual mass as a subject. Negative space and minimal compositions tell a different story than just like what we would consider a typical composition. So 
here's an image of my friend uh, Sinker's. Um, this is maybe four years ago. I feel like it wasn't that long ago because COVID years just get compressed into like one long year. But this is about four years ago in Mongolia. We we're scouting for a workshop and uh, shooting at the Congar and Els uh, singing sand dunes in the southern southern Gobi Desert. And it's this beautiful, massive stretch of sand dunes and when the wind blows they actually do sing and that's that's where the name comes from uh so i wanted to take some photos of my friends it was myself dave sinclair here and uh my my friend paul zitska and we were scouting for a workshop and for me i was like trying to get that that one shot that really looked like that that adventure that journey that expedition into the sand to get the shot uh, and this is a lot of what I was shooting when I first got there. Again, that whole like, got to shoot everything. Like, you know, who knows what's coming next? We're sort of on a fixed schedule a little bit with the, the operators that we were there with. But we did go back to that location a couple of days later and went in at a different time of day. And I waited until like, you know, uh, I'm pretty, I think this is Paul in this shot was a little further up in the dunes, got that clean backdrop. I got nicer light, better shape and form in the dunes themselves compared to this like midday shot and really placed my subject and that strong silhouette in that uh, and intentionally put him directly on the bottom. So this is, goes back to what I was saying about how the human form carries a lot of weight you know, he's very small in comparison to how much empty space and sky and then the dunes themselves. So it might seem like that's a lot of wasted space up there, but it doesn't feel unbalanced to me. It feels like he's the perfect anchor, right? He's just the right size to anchor this whole image. And then my eyes kind of go back up, zigzag all the way through those dunes, you know, spend a little time in the sky, straight back down to my anchor. And then sort of repeat and the other thing that's great about this shot is that uh one of the other like side quests of being there is that we were scouting for a workshop but we we're also trying to create marketing material so there's all this wonderful blank space in the top for logos for the title of the workshop for dates you know all that kind of stuff right and that's something else that for a practical commercial like how do you make money shooting minimalist photography well, this is an example of how you do that especially for travel because magazines and whatnot, they need they need covers that look like this. Here's that lighthouse I showed you guys before with the black and white long exposure, but we're over, we're closer, we're obviously in a different position. And I shot this house lighthouse a bunch, um, not a lot of times at night, but it's a beautiful sky above the lighthouse. And uh, I think I was doing a astral workshop or something that night and i i remember thinking like i like the shot i just don't like the positioning of the lighthouse uh and i want it being out there under the stars with the lighthouse and this is the oldest one of the oldest lighthouses in newfoundland um i i wanted it to very much be about the sky and the what's above the lighthouse, right? Like this lighthouse to the universe kind of idea was playing through my mind. And so this is a simple, all this is is a crop. So this is the original image and then cropping it to sort of fit that vision a little bit better. And all of a sudden it's much more simplified. It's much more minimal. I haven't taken a lot out, but I've taken out all that's unnecessary to, tell the story I was trying to tell, right? So this is very much more about the, the sky itself above the lighthouse. Puffins over the water, you'll often see them flying like this. In groups, but again, um, I've been out on these little boat tours and, and, and photo workshops with these guys so many times that I knew there was a better shot, a simpler shot, a cleaner shot. And what happens quite often here in Newfoundland is when the sun goes down, or gets close to sundown, like this sort of fog bank creeps in over close and low to the ocean. So that was, again, was just a matter of going back out again at a different time of day and waiting for the water to chill out, for the fog to set in, and then to just isolate a puffin by themselves to create a shot that looks like this. And again, this is 
this is a minimal shot as far as like there's not a lot going on but it's also kind of no crazy right it's it's a bit chaotic there's a lot of texture in the water the puffins are overlapping you don't know which puffin i want you to look at again it's it's a simple shot not a complicated shot but this is a minimalist shot that has much stronger emotion in my opinion like there's a there's a story here so the third exercise is what we've been talking about this whole time, seeing space. So finding subjects, composing a frame around that subject, concentrate on the space uh, and look for the spaces and the gaps. And here's a, an image where I use that, I think pretty effectively. This is in Baker Lake, Nunavut. Uh, some kids were out playing pond hockey. I was there on an assignment for a mining company, a gold mine actually in the territory and uh i wasn't working for the mining company i was working for um i think the hamlet and uh they had some sort of um i think it was for like promoting kids through school and things like that but the mining company was part of it and i was in town for a week a little over a week and i noticed these kids out in the evenings playing ice on the lake behind where i was staying and so one night I went out there, I had some time and I just walked around the ice up and down, up and down and kind of waited and watched. And what I like about this shot is that this isn't photoshopped to create space. I just watched them long enough to notice where all those spaces were going to be and waited for it to happen. And then I took a lot of shots where, you know, like, they were overlapping or, you know, they're, they're, they were on top of the net or somebody was like standing in front of the ATV or whatever. I only got one shot where there was the right amount of space between every subject. And then all those subjects were the right amount of space away from the edges of the frame. And there was the right amount of space in the sky. And so like, again, this is another example of revisiting, going back to the same spot and then going out even on that one night when it all worked and it was like two hours, right, of waiting. And maybe I could have done this a lot more easily and quickly if I just went over to them and organized the whole thing, but that wasn't the vibe and the energy, right? Like I wasn't, this is an example of, I wasn't radioing, radioing anybody to create the image. This was very much more about patience uh, and, and thinking like, yeah, this is a cool storytelling shot of like kids playing pond hockey in Northern Canada. But I think that without all that, space and those gaps it's not it's not as powerful it's not as strong okay so here's the final image we'll start with that nice and clean pretty color uh great shape great lines leading in um i love the the space in this i love how it's divided so it's 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 exactly how i wanted it to look and i noticed this stand of trees renee and i were in the Rockies shooting, she had a job. I think I was just tagging along to play with horses at this point. And so I was very much just like, um, you know, I was useless. But uh, I noticed we drove by these trees a couple times uh, on the way to her, her actual painting job. And I was frustrated because I was trying to take pictures over the course of a weekend and I was getting nothing I liked. And every time we drove by these trees, like on the roadside, I would just think, this is the shot, this is the shot, this is the shot. And then finally she had enough of it and she just pulled over and she's like, take the bleep and picture. <laughs> and so I rolled out of the car. I immediately fell through like about 40 feet of brambles, you know, losing my gear, losing a boot, losing a mitt um, and ended up, you know, ass over tea kettle, uh, looking at these trees and thinking, okay, I'm here, let's take the shot. So this is, this is like how it started. I'm looking for, because as much as these trees uh, are what ended up in my final image, it wasn't necessarily clear to me at the time that that would be the shot, right? It goes back to that idea of walking around in, and, and just paying attention to what speaks to you, what's punching you in the gut. You don't, actually know what the shot is you just know there's something there something's made you stop and notice and you haven't quite figured it out yet and that only comes with the you know the effort and the patience and the time and the work so at first i thought maybe it was this like pretty color right like the contrast of 
that nice yellow against the turquoise uh, in the water. So I played with that for a bit, but this is obviously not a clean shot and I was not happy with it. Also, this was like one of the first shots I took after falling out of the car. So I was probably not in a good frame of mind to consider that my best work. Then I noticed this nice leading line and I was like, okay, I can build, I can work off of this leading line. Like for me, it was about the color of the water and just, and just isolating a tree. Didn't matter which tree it was at this point, but I liked this leading line of ice. I liked that idea of like winter. So this was early in the winter season. So the lake hadn't frozen over yet. Also side note, one of the reasons why I was not in a good mood is because this is like a huge methane lake, methane bubbles uh, in the winter. And I don't know if you guys have seen a lot of those photos in the Rockies with the, the perfectly uh, clear ice and all the layers of bubbles that go down through and then the mountains in the background. Uh, I was convinced I was going to get that amazing shot and we show up there and the obviously I'm not walking out on that ice. Um, so I was kind of pissed, but you know, because my girlfriend kicked me out of the car and didn't really give me a choice. I decided I had to make the best of it. So again, playing with this leading line here, it's like, I like this line. I like how clean the water is, but this angle is not really working. Let's try a different angle. Okay. I like this. Now it's kind of like going from the bottom left to a very sharp point back up to the or bottom right sharp point top right this this shape this form this line i feel like is better for me but there's a lot more going on in the top um, not really isolating trees i've got this foreground garbage okay let's zoom in past all that keep the angle keep the line going in but again i'm not really isolating those trees in the top so how are we gonna how are we gonna get there okay now we're starting to get there uh, you know, just modifying it, but I've lost that leading line. This is a little closer. I've got a little bit of junk going on in the bottom. I'm starting to, you know, feel that pressure again at this point. I'm starting to think like, this is pointless. You know, I'm too angry. I'm too hulked out to figure this out. You know, that point you get with photography where you're just so angry, you just don't care anymore. So I kind of start looking over my shoulder a little bit to see if like I'm allowed back in the car and it was like a big nope. So, I, you know, I'm like, well, F this composition. I'll just shoot any stupid tree and I'll get back in the car. So I shot this one. I was like, there you go. Isolate it. Done. But of course, I was not that happy. I knew the other shot was the better shot. I had to like commit and stay with it. So finally, I got to the point where I, you know, kind of got it the way I wanted it to be. I wanted to get rid of some of that texture. I wanted to like get it a little cleaner. So I put on an ND filter. I exposed to get the texture out of the water. And what you'll notice with this shot is the crop whoop, to get the top right tree branches out. And I know that when I crop this, I also still had probably like a pinky fingernail size piece of tree, which I probably clone stamped out or something like that in Photoshop. And then the bottom left, those little twigs, I think I might've cloned those out as well. I mean, I, you can see that I cropped it a bit, but I'm pretty sure maybe I might've cleaned that up in Photoshop. But for the most part, then it was like color contrast and color grading. Uh, but most of that was done like by lens choice, angle, perspective, swearing, um, not being allowed back in the car, pressure to succeed, that kind of stuff. But, uh, you know, this is, this is kind of where I started, like here, right? And a lot of us might stop and give up with that, right? If you couldn't get it. But knowing that you can go from, you know, this to this over the course of 30 minutes, like that's reason enough to stick with it, you know? So that's just a little bit about working the shot and isolating that anchor, like feeling out what that anchor is and then just sticking with it uh, and making it as clean and, and just keep decluttering, decluttering, decluttering until it's just down to that essential storytelling pieces. That's all you need. Uh, I, I have this one last slide. So like I, I, this is going to look like it was intentional that I had more to tell you guys and we ran out of time, but I do have a class shameless plug for like three hours of of like minimalism if you want more <laughs> good but uh but yeah we do
we do workshops all over. We have workshops here in Newfoundland this summer. Um, we're working uh, on getting a couple international things up and going, uh, depending on how rules and regulations and all that plays out. Right, right. Um, and then, and then for those of you guys that are that are watching or maybe watching the recording in the description, I'm going to put all of Curtis's links. So you'll be able to go to his YouTube channel and his social media. And I've got links to um, his, ex his excursion links for his site for that him and Renee are doing. So you can fully follow him, reach out to him. And if you're uh, not already part of the the TWIP community, that would be um, I'll put a link in the in the chat. But Curtis is there, and he's part of the community where we all share and chat and talk with everybody. And um, he's very accessible there, uh, as is as is Renee. Yeah, definitely, hundred percent. Kind of yeah, yeah. So. Everybody claps. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That was good. That was so yeah, great. Um, Thank you, Curtis. Thank you for doing that. Yeah. <laughs> so again, uh, Curtis, I thank you so very much for this. And I and I'm not kidding. I I really see you as as sort of this embodiment of Galen Rowell and um, some of his philosophies of you know, he, he never really used the terms of minimalism, but he really spoke about his intentionalities and how he shot. And uh, I see a lot of that in you, especially the shots of you hanging from climbing ropes and, and things yeah. like that. That was very much Galen. So um, oh, that's cool. I, I, I Thanks for that. Yeah, I think that's I think that's super cool. Um, so anyway, thank you guys uh, for joining us. And I hope everybody has a safe and a wonderful remaining of your week. If you're a part of the TWIP Pro community um, at thisweekinphoto.com, I'll see you guys on Friday for the member mixer. So thanks so much cool. for the invitation. Thanks, Mike. Take care, Thank guys. you. Take care, everybody. Great. Thank you. Good program. Good night.